Here, read this. Woof. Hello everybody, Ash here from the Ear Read This podcast. On my last video, I mentioned that when I'm not making Edinburgh's most powerful book podcast, I'm working in one of Edinburgh's bookshops, John Kay's, on Victoria Street. And in that video, I talked a little bit about the literary myths associated with Victoria Street and its environs. Uh, and today I want to talk more about the shop itself, John Kay's, and specifically the name behind the shop. John Kay was a caricaturist living in Edinburgh in the late 18th, early 19th century. And despite the fact that his caricatures are very famous and appear in, in history books, often uncredited, the man himself is not very well known or well written about. Most of the books you can find about John Kay are usually collections of his prints with a little gloss about each caricature, usually paraphrased from his own notes, but fairly thin on biographical detail on the man himself. That was until 2017 with the publication of this book, The Edinburgh of John Kay by Eric Melvin. And uh, I was lucky enough to interview Eric recently at the shop. So, where did John Kay's uh, career as a caricaturist start? Right, well, it's a very good question, Ash. He never had any formal academic training as regards art, nor was he trained to become an engraver. But in his own sort of autobiographical notes, he describes uh, his father dies when he's very young in Dalkeith, and he's taken in by cousins in Leith who treat him very badly, uh, and he takes to just wandering the streets. And he describes wandering the streets, picking up bits of charcoal or old pencils, and just practicing drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and he seems just to have developed his own natural talent. He doesn't seriously get into drawing uh, until one of his uh, clients as a, a barber he comes to Edinburgh in 1762 with his young wife, Lily Stephen. And um, one of his clients, his customers, is Hugh Nisbet of Archerfield, Archfield House, which still stands. And Nisbet took a shine to John Kay and he had him staying in the house for weeks on end, doing the hair of the family, the servants, and on his estates. And he recognised his talent and he bought him crayons and he bought him paints. And apparently he did miniatures of the children of Hugh Nisbet, none of which I don't think have survived. Um, and he comes back to Edinburgh and he starts doing caricatures of some of his customers. And there's a very good contemporary account of how he would put the caricatures that he'd drawn overnight in the shop window. And people would crowd around the windows in Parliament Close just to see who John Kay had drawn. Um, Hugh Nisbet dies, I think, in 1782 and leaves him an annuity. Mm -hmm. So he then has a chance to give up being a full-time barber, and he's a very good barber, and becoming a full-time artist. And then his wife, Lily Stephen, dies, and that seems to be the tipping point. And I think it's 1784, he does his first professional um, portraits mm. uh, and puts these up for sale. Oh, I love the idea because it's, it's like hairdressers now have the cuts in the window to yes. show you what the cuts that's are, that's so right. actually has his drawings. So that's what decorated his windows in Parliament Close. Yeah. And he became, on the back of these caricatures, famous in his own day, a, yes. a celebrity. He was. He was very much recognised in his own day as a celebrity. And the very generous tributes paid to him by his mm. contemporaries who recognised that he was a genius. And two or three writers, including William Creech, who engaged John Kay to illustrate his book about the trial of Deacon Brodie, commented that he seemed to be able, just at a glance, to get a very accurate representation. So virtually none of his portraits are studio portraits mm. and I could imagine he'd be going around the streets with a clipboard and a pencil and just suddenly catching an image, taking it home, working it up and then having to engrave it and print it off. So he seems to have had a photographic memory um, and you know, somebody suggested he was you know, perhaps on a, an odd scale that he could do that and hold that um, image and it wasn't just the image because uh, my wife Linda and I had a very interesting lecture four or five years ago at Lauriston Castle, but an academic from Glasgow University talked about John Kay. But it wasn't about the characters, it was the accuracy of the contemporary dress, how he was able to get minute details, both of men's and women's clothing, and also change with fashion. Mm. Uh, and he was able to keep on top of that. His fame was there right up to his last days. Yeah. Um, his last um, portrait, as far as the published work was concerned, uh, I think it's about 1821. Mm. Um, so he's almost 80 years old. Mm. And I think at that point, perhaps his eyesight, perhaps arthritis or something, caught up with him. 
Um, he certainly was around, uh, living in 227 the High Street, when George IV came in 1822, mm. but he's left no record of that. So you, you'd like to think, as an old man, he sat in a chair and watched the king going past, but it wasn't recorded in any way. Mm. So he's still working uh, at a very high standard, you know, right up to his last days. Mm. So, and there certainly there were very generous obituaries when he passed on. Yeah. And interestingly, when the, the, the portraits were published posthumously, uh, he died before he could publish the work that he'd intended to do, and he started doing biographical notes. And his wife, his second wife, carried on the business, uh, but she died in the 1830s, and there was an auction of all the plates and the prints and the notes. And fortunately, the plates, the surviving plates, were purchased by his great friend Hugh Payton. And it was Hugh Payton who then employed a journalist, a chap called Patterson from Ayrshire, to write up the notes that John Kay had started. And they're published in 1837 in two volumes. And at that time, as you know, um, publishers, ed authors look for subscribers to mm -hmm. sort of give a guarantee of sales. And the first subscriber is Queen Victoria, who's only come to the throne that year in 1837. The second subscriber is this, her mother, the Duchess of Kent. And a large number of copies were bought by London publishers, booksellers, so he had a national reputation. Good start, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, could you tell us about some of the notable figures he caricatured? Well, well yes. Um, he's, he's living at such an interesting time. Um, Edinburgh is just emerging from a very disastrous few decades after the Act of Union, which hurt Edinburgh very badly, unlike Glasgow and the West Coast. Uh, and Edinburgh's also struggling because it's got a very black cloud over its head because Edinburgh had allowed Bonnie Prince Charlie to capture the city without a shot being fired in uh, 1745. And then there's the Porteous Riot where the captain of the town guard is dragged out and lynched and nobody's ever prosecuted. So Edinburgh's reputation UK level is pretty low and on top of that we've still got a situation where the, the fundamentalist covenanting Church of Scotland is deliberately trying to suppress Scottish culture. So music, singing, dancing, opera are all frowned upon and it took two very brave people who were just too far into their lives for Kate to actually catch them. Alan Ramsey, the poet, mm -hmm. Father of Alan Ramsey, the artist, and of course um, David Hume, mm -hmm. who challenged the control of the church. And the confidence that that gave to younger people was just enormous. And that then sees the university attracting some fantastic minds, you know, like Adam Black, for example, James Hutton. And they're all living together, working together, socialising together. So there's so much going on in Edinburgh at that time. And at the same time, the city is transforming itself physically because John Kay arrives just before the first house is started in Newtown. Mm -hmm. And for a short time he stays in Princess Street in the house that's just being built. So Edinburgh's undergoing profound change and he's recording that in the portraits that he drew. But that's fascinating. You, you said uh, it's, it's such an interesting time and your book, as the title, uh, The Edinburgh of John Kay implies, does it, it's not just a biography of John Kay, it's a biography well, yes, of a slice yeah, of Edinburgh. You know, there are three books that I'm aware of that have been published regarding John Kay, but they tend to simply be a selection of his best portraits. Uh, and the notes that are provided with the, the portraits that have been sort of paraphrased. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I thought he deserved more than that, because he's living at such an exciting time, and Edinburgh deserved more than that. So it's trying to put the historical background with the Act of Union, the Porteous Riot, uh, the Jacobite capture of Edinburgh, and then the challenge to the church, and then suddenly Edinburgh takes off. And having been described in very unflattering terms by visitors like Daniel Defoe, by the end of the century, people are looking upon Edinburgh um, as you know, arguably the intellectual capital of the Western world, with all the work that's going on. The, development of the new town. So it's a wonderful time to be in Edinburgh and he captures so much of that in his portraits and in his notes. What was your uh, sort of research process like? Because it, it feels like you had pretty slim pickings in terms of what was written <laughs> about it. <laughs> well, well, it's a good question. I first encountered John Kay when I was a young history teacher at Liberton High School. We had a very good art and design department and there was a very talented six-year lad who was heading off to college and he was working up his portfolio. Uh, and he specialised in, in sort of portraiture. Mm. And I don't know whether it's the head of the department or who, but all of a sudden, uh, two volumes of Kay's portraits arrived. Not the first edition, but a later cheap edition that mm. came out long after his death. Uh, and the student was doing wonderful 
drawings direct from the illustrations in the book and I was curious at that mm -hmm. um, and then I was uh, asked by the BBC to do a programme about Deacon Brodie, a school's history broadcast mm -hmm. and I came across of course the, the image of Deacon Brodie yes. uh, which we've got here yes. um, and this is John Key is the only person who's done a likeness of Deacon Brodie. Yeah, yeah. So he draws Deacon Brodie four times. Mm. He draws him when he meets his fellow Robert George Smith uh, in 1786. He draws him in the condemned cell. He draws him in the courtroom. And unpublished, he also draws his execution mm. at, at the old toll booth. And I was impressed by the sort of the detail uh, of this. So I read a little bit more and read a little bit more. Um, and then I was fortunate, I was asked to rewrite a school history book. Uh, so with the royalties, I actually bought two volumes of case portraits. Oh, um, uh, one of my favourite ones is, is the, uh, the New Haven fishwife. Yeah. I just, I love the way that she almost looks like a, a, a cockerel, <laughs> almost with the, uh, the basket on her back, giving her kind of this fanned uh, look. Well, it's very interesting because as a child, there were still fishwives in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And I can remember um, a lady called Margaret Langlands, mm -hmm. uh, who came from Fisher Row, Musselburgh, up on the tram every day uh, and went round our local streets looking just like that, the mm -hmm. same uniform and the same basket. And she would have her creel of fish. My mum would pick a fish out. She would gut it at the front door. And uh, the fishwives of Fisher Row were famous for a choir. There's a long tradition of singing whilst they were gutting. Uh, so she asked us down once to listen to the Fishwives Choir. So the story behind this, and we wouldn't have got these wonderful anecdotes if it hadn't been for John Kay. Shall I, mm. shall I tell the story? Yes, please do. Yeah. Right. Well, this, this refers to David Hume, who was not drawn by John Kay. But David Hume, um, living in the old town, was one of the first to purchase a property in the, the new town. And he's very impatient. He's wanting to see how his house is getting on. And the recently completed North Bridge, the southern piers had fallen down. Several people were killed in 1769. So you either had to make a long detour around what is now Easter Road, or you had to paddle across the partially drained Nor Loch, where Princess Street Gardens now is. And Hume was a bachelor. He's a very good cook. He loved food very heavy man and he's got his big coat on and he's paddling across planks that people have put down. He loses his footing and he falls in and he's on his back and he can't get up. He's floundering around and John Kay tells the story of several fishwives coming up from New Haven heading to the, the old town and their customers and there's Kay, uh, sorry, there's Hume pleading for help and the fishwives, knowing him, knowing his reputation, and also that he's an atheist, will said, we'll only help you if you can recite the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> so there's all sorts of wonderful little snippets of uh, entertaining anecdote contained yeah. in John Kay's portraits. So that, that's a favourite one. Um, there's also, I mean, John Kay himself, this is, if you like, his, his promotion. This is his advert. So he's decided to go full time and he's trying to um, display himself as... Uh, you know, somebody of means, so he's got his best clothes on, he's got his lace cravat, his cuffs, he's got his powdered wig on, uh, and he's trying to show that, you know, he's not just an idle scribbler. So he's looking at uh, Homer, he's mm -hmm. got his hands on the works of Plato, the tools of his trade are there, his artist's palette, his paints, his engraving tools, and he often liked to put a joke in his drawings, so he claimed he had the biggest, fattest cat in Edinburgh <laughs> sitting on the back of his chair. Um, if that's to scale, I mean, it must have been. Well, it was enormous. <laughs> enormous cat. <laughs> there might have been a wee bit of artistic license. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. And also with Deacon Brodie. Yeah. Again, there's, there's a joke here, which Edinburgh people would, would see. So this had been commissioned by William Creech, who published The Trial of Deacon Brodie. Creech managed to get himself on the jury, and he managed to get Kay into the packed courtroom. Uh, and Kay has illustrated Deacon Brodie posing as though he's going to a ball uh, or a concert in the condemned cell and on the table he's put the items that have brought Deacon Brodie to the condemned cell. Uh, and so there's cards and dice because he blew the inherited fortune on gambling. Mm -hmm. um, in 1786 he and George Smith, the housebreaker from London, meet up and they come up with a very clever plan for robbing houses. Mm -hmm. So instead of knocking down doors or breaking windows, um, Deacon Brody could visit his workmen. He's a cabinet maker, a very skilled cabinet maker. And the Edinburgh practice was to hang your keys um, on a peg inside your front door. So in his pocket, he carried a lump of putty 
so he made skeleton keys. He was able to sort of case the houses he was going to rob, mm -hmm. find out where the valuables were, knowing something of where his customers were likely to be, he and Smith could go in and out without a problem. However, they try to rob the excise house in Chessel's Court. They're greedy. The robber, robbery fails and two of the robbers are caught and Brodie is revealed as the head of the gang. He flees, gets to London and disappears. And he would have got away completely. Um, he manages to get to, to Holland and he's heading for Amsterdam to uh, get a ship to, to the United States. And he writes two letters uh, which are delivered back to Edinburgh, one to one of his mistresses, he had five illegitimate children, and one to the brother of his mistress. And the letters got into the hands of the authority, and he said, I'm going to Amsterdam, I'm getting shipped to New York, um, please come and join me and bring my box of tools. Mm -hmm. So there's quill pens and the paper that uh, brought him to the condemned cell. So there are often these little jokes that people little at the time jokes. would appreciate yeah. um, from his, his drawings. But he, he had such a wide panoply of characters. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the giants of the golden age um, or leading figures in the judiciary like Lord Braxfield or Lord, Ma Lord Monboddo or Lord Gardenston. Um, he also does visitors to Edinburgh. Uh, he also does contemporary political figures who he's never met, but he does William Pitt, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but he also does street characters, you know, not just the fishwife, but sedan, cheer carriers, town guardsmen. So you've got a very wide-ranging picture of what Edinburgh looked like at that time. Yeah. So I feel we should be very grateful to him because he's not nearly as well known, I think, no, as he ought to be. Definitely, definitely. Edinburgh emerges from a long, long shadowy existence where the, the church has just suppressed all sorts of cultural life. And suddenly Edinburgh blossoms. And St. Cecilia's Hall is built, the old playhouse is built in the Canongate, and in 1769, James Boswell um, led a torchlight parade to the new Theatre Royal, mm. which stood at the East End on the site of the building I still remember as the old post office. Mm. And such was the reputation of the Edinburgh Theatre that um, they were able to bring some star performers up from London. And this is John Kay's portrait of the most famous actress of the day, Sarah Siddons. Um, who was lured up to Edinburgh and getting paid a colossal sum of something like £2,000 a week. So she's performing as Lady Douglas in the Scottish tragedy um, written by John Hume, who was an East Lothian minister. Uh, and it's not a historical tale, but it's, it's a, a sort of Macbeth. Um, it's all going to be a tragedy. It's all about a disputed inheritance. But she came from the London stage and she was a diva. She simply needed to appear on stage. She'd get a standing ovation. And every time she had a big speech, there'd be cheering and clapping. Uh, and so she comes expecting the same treatment to Edinburgh. It's John Kay who tells the story that the first act of Douglas, she comes on stage, silence. She throws herself into a speech, silence. First act finishes. The second act, it's the same, and she's really getting desperate. What's gone wrong? And so the final act, the final big speech, she absolutely flings herself into the speech as Lady Douglas. Silence. And then a wee Scots voice from the stall shouts, that's no bad. <laughs> and the whole theatre erupts in uh, applause, uh, and people fight to get tickets for the remaining performances. Um, so that's, that's again an anecdote we wouldn't have known yeah. anything about if it hadn't been for John, John Kay. Kay yeah. um, or again, he records the visit of the famous Italian balloonist, uh, Vincenzo Lunardi, who makes a balloon flight in London and then for some reason comes to Edinburgh and stays in a hotel in Princess Street. Now, he claimed to have made the first balloon flight in the UK, but he wasn't. Uh, an Edinburgh centric called James Teichler had made the first balloon flight um, in a hot air balloon uh, in what's now the Queen's Park. And he would parked his balloon in the partially finished dome of what's now Register House. Mm. So he flies a short distance and crashes, but he survives. But Lunardi comes and 20,000 people gather on the grounds of Heriot's to watch uh, him going up. And there he is with a, a Union flag, a cannon is fired, uh, and you can imagine the amazement as people watch. They've never seen anything like this before. The balloon 
goes up into the air. Now he's no control over it and people look in horror as it's blown away out towards the Firth of Forth. The wind blows it down toward North Berwick and then the wind changes direction, blows him across and he crash lands in a field near Cooper in Fife which is being harvested and he's almost killed by the farm labourers who think this is the devil coming from the sky. <laughs> he's rescued by the local minister uh, and he's toasted in St Andrews, he comes to Edinburgh, he makes several other flights, he even crash lands in the Firth of Forth and is rescued in a fishing boat. Uh, the Edinburgh men didn't really like him because he was always boasting and used to toast Lunardi whom the ladies love. Mm. But he was a real hit and if you know your Robert Burns, the poem to a louse, it describes a Lunardi bonnet, so he was a fashion yeah. icon as well. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favourites, and uh, I think you, you're aware of this, Ash, because this, you can imagine John Kay is walking along the partially completed Princess Street, and this is number 91 Princess Street, and this is the townhouse of Robert Craig of Rickerton, out to the west of Edinburgh, uh, and um, Robert Craig had always been a great walker, but he's now in his late 70s and he can no longer walk with ease. This is his servant of 40 years, William Scott, at the window and each morning he dresses um, Robert Craig in his walking gear. So he's got his hat, his staff, he's got his boots, his gaiters, his coat and it's a lovely moment because he's sitting uh, at his front door looking east towards the Cotton Hill and the rising sun. And I think there's a touching little bit about that. Yeah. Um, or again, this this took real courage on the part of John Key because um, Edinburgh is doing famously. The Golden Age is rattling along and all of a sudden comes the French Revolution, 1789. At first it's welcomed. France is going to get rid of the Ancien Regime and have a constitutional monarchy like the UK. And then all of a sudden the terror breaks out mm -hmm. and there's panic. The British establishment are fearful that the ideas of the revolution are going to come across and infect the working classes here and at the same time there are many middle class people like this man here Thomas Muir who are looking to have the franchise extended practically nobody had the right to vote um, certainly not the middle classes and so they would meet in discussion groups and talk about uh, the ideas of democracy following the example of the United States mm. and a book they often refer to was written two books written by Thomas Paine um, who had inspired the American Revolution. He wrote a famous book called Common Sense. But such was the fear of the government that even owning that book um, could see you um, guilty of sedition and possibly executed. Uh, so Muir is arrested. Uh, he's gone to France because uh, the people in France have asked that he goes to try and rescue Louis XVI and plead for his life, but she fails to do. He's locked up instead. He comes back. He's been outlawed. He's brought to Edinburgh. He's put on trial in front of the notorious Lord Braxfield and the jury are all hand-picked. They're going to find him guilty. Uh, and he defends himself and it's, it's a sensational trial and he's sentenced to 15 years transportation in Botany Bay. But John Key makes his political um, affiliations quite clear and he writes, illustrious martyr to the glorious cause of truth, of freedom and of equal laws. And he could well have been arrested for that, but mm -hmm. that took a fair bit of courage. He also championed um, the church uh, and a group of ministers who were called the New Lichts, mm. who were challenging the old Calvinist grip of a group called the Old Lichts, a uh, particularly famous minister called Alexander Carlyle of Inderesk, who was part of that Golden Age group. Um, another famous picture that I'm very fond of, if you go to the National Portrait Gallery, uh, you'll see a little tassie medallion of Adam Smith, the famous economist. And it says that he never posed for his portrait in his lifetime. And yet there are two portraits of Adam Smith done by John Kay, the author of The Wealth of Nations. Uh, and there he is standing in his study pointing to his book. Um, so he did pose for, for John yeah. Kay. This appears to be um, an eyewitness account of a fierce argument that took place outside John Kay's house in 227 High Street or outside his workshop uh, in Parliament Close. Now, it's, it's quite a dark print. I'm sorry about that. But the conversation is recorded verbatim by John Kay mm. and the gentleman on the right with the striped waistcoat is pointing a finger and telling this man that his writing, his travel writings, are all made up. It's all fanciful. 
and there's more truth in one page of his Edinburgh Street Directory than in the seven volumes that this man has written. So the man doing the finger pointing um, is a story in himself. He's a man called Peter Williamson. As a child, he was kidnapped in Aberdeen and sold as a slave. And this was connived at by the council, who obviously got a backhander for every child that was seized and taken across the Atlantic. He's lucky he's bought by a fellow Scot. Mm. So he becomes a house servant rather than a, a plantation slave. His master dies, gives him his freedom, and he sets up a farm, but he's immediately captured by Native Americans taken away as a prisoner, witnesses all sorts of atrocities, uh, but after several months of really hard captivity, um, he escapes and he runs for days and eventually hides up a tree and gets away. He gets back to the British colonies just in time for the start of the Seven Years' War. He joins the militia, he's captured again, but he's paroled and eventually he gets back penniless to the UK. He's determined to have his revenge on Aberdeen Council. So he writes a book about his experiences, gets himself up to Aberdeen and challenges the council, who promptly lock him up and uh, burn all his books. However, other parents, other families who've lost children realise that, you know, he's telling the truth here. This is what's happened. So the council is, is exposed and he gets a lot of compensation. He comes to Edinburgh, opens a coffee shop in Parliament Close, starts Edinburgh's first post and also starts Edinburgh's first street directory. But he bumps into this man here, who is James Bruce of Kinnaird in Stirlingshire. Six foot three, an enormous man, um, and he's had a most adventurous life. Uh, he ends up being British consul in Algiers. Mm. And he's absolutely appalled at the cruelty that he witnesses, you know, people getting hands chopped off and all sorts of things. He's also horrified at the hundreds of Europeans who are being sold in the slave markets of North Africa, including British people, who he can't do anything to help. So he resigns. And he then sets off um, with a, a little group of um, servants and an artist to sail up the Nile. So he sails up the Nile, and he's the first Westerner to do it. He sails up the Nile as far as Luxor. And he then crosses the desert to the Red Sea because he's trying to get to what he called Gondor, Abyssinia, to find the source of the Blue Nile. Um, people hadn't appreciated that the Blue Nile and the White Nile were going to join together uh, at Khartoum. And he spends time in the royal court. There's constant civil war in, in what, let's call it, Abyssinia. Uh, and it's a fearsome time of murder and mutilation, but he survives because he dresses as an Arab, he learns Arabic, and he's taught himself some basic medicine so he can cure the king. Uh, eventually he gets permission to go searching for the source of the Blue Nile, and he gets very, very close to the real source. He's shown a spring just close to Lake Tana, where the Nile actually emerges from. He then escapes, uh, smuggles himself out, and follows the Blue Nile, and he's the first to witness the confluent, first European to witness the confluence of the Blue Nile with the White Nile. There's a lot of banditry going on, so he takes a huge risk and cuts across the desert to Aswan and nearly dies. Um, but he survives and he brings back a huge number of um, botanical specimens, animal specimens, drawings, and the scientists believe him. Mm. But when he publishes accounts of his adventures, including the practice of the Abyssinians with their cattle of their feeling hungry, slicing a steak off their rump and eating it raw, this is just too much. Mm. And so people don't believe him. Um, and he comes to a sad end, having had all sorts of adventures and escapes. He entertains on a grand stale at Kinnaird House and he likes to dress in Arab costume. So he's entertained the dinner party and he's escorting a couple down the stairs to their carriage. His foot catches in his Arab robe, falls, bangs his head and he dies. A, a very sad end. Yeah. But um, it's a wonderful confrontation. Thank you very much for watching everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed this video on John Kay. Just uh, wanted to say at the end of this video, a huge thank you to Eric for, for coming along and talking to us about The Prince. I will leave a link in the episode description box below to where you can get a copy of this book, uh, Eric's book, Edinburgh of John Kay. And if you fancy getting your hands on an actual John Kay print, then we do uh, sell the ones you saw in the video in the shop. So if you fancy dropping in, 
talking a little bit about John Kay and looking through his prints, do so by all means. That's it for today. Until next time, happy reading.